Hello, and welcome to Django Chat, a weekly podcast on the Django web framework. This week, we're joined by Tom Dyson to discuss Wagtail, a leading content management system built upon Django. I'm joined, as always, by Carlton Gibson. Hi, Carlton. Hello. And Tom. Hi. Hi, everyone. So before we dive in, Tom, do you want to do a quick background on Wagtail and how you got into Django? Yeah, sure. So uh, I'm I'm one of the two founders of Torchbox. We're a digital agency based in the UK. Uh, 70 people now split across two cities, uh, Oxford and Bristol. But we've been going for a long time. We started in, in 2000. And um, we've been using Django since really the early days. So 2008, I think I made the first ever screencast for Django, which is uh, I'm, I'm, I'm still quite proud of. You, you can look that up. And what year, what year was that? Uh, 2005? 2006, 2007, maybe. I'll, I'll send you a link. Um, okay. Yeah, and, we'll include uh, that in the I, show notes. You know notes what? The funny everyone. thing is that it, I, I picked the same bit of uh, Django Reinhardt guitar from, for that screencast that you use for Django Chat. So no one has mentioned it because it's, yeah, it's sort of the Django Reinhardt uh, jingle. And yeah. I always, even, yeah, I, I wonder if listeners picked up on that, but you did. So maybe you're the I, first. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure many others did too. So, so yeah, we've been we've been big fans of Django for a long time. In fact, um, uh, Andrew Godwin, um, who I, I hired sort of as a as a fresh faced university student in, in in Oxford, where where we're based, and um, he joined Torchbox, and uh, it's actually for for one of our client projects that he he wrote South, which of course became the migrations framework, which is now part of Django. And Simon Willison, one of the two authors of Django, also worked here for a while on a. A project called the Carbon Account, kind of ambitious but ultimately doomed project to help companies track their carbon footprints in a very precise way. So, so I feel like we've got a bit of uh, Django heritage that we're very proud of. Um. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm impressed. I mean, because I know Django was uh, cr- created in Kansas, but I mean, Simon, who's British, was was there. I'm impressed by always the the large English footprint. I guess that's you know, as an American, I sort of assume. <laughs> the world revolves around the U.S., but there's a large number of very important Django folks. I mean, both of you, Tom Christie, Andrew, um, Simon. You know, I wonder if there's something specific about England, or that's just you know, it's a global programming community. Yeah, I don't know. With Django. I, I, I was struck up by that as well, actually, just in in Copenhagen and uh, DjangoCon Europe, where where Colton and I were last week, and uh, yeah, there did seem to be kind of a high proportion of, of British people there, and, and yeah, I'm not sure the reason. Um, Carlton, do you have any any guesses? Yeah, so uh, yeah, I do. I mean, like, so I don't. A British people probably notice British people. That, that, so there's a. It might be a slight bias in our observation there. But um, it, America and Europe and Australia were, have been. I think you know, if you look at the, the greatest hitters, there's. It's not just Britain. It's Europe as well. Continental Europe, um, America, Australia is a. You know, we're trying to make the that that contribution base more diverse but historically that's been that's been where it's at and then tom i believe so uh, wagtail you you were at the agency you found a way to convince a client to help fund its initial uh, generation is that right that's Back right in the day? yeah so we'd been uh, i guess what we're best known for in the last 15 years is building big public facing websites content managed sites generally for for people making the world a better place and um we in 2007 we we adopted Drupal, uh, a very well known PHP open source content management system. That's um, uh, you know it's got a lot of momentum, particularly in that nonprofit space, and a fantastic community and very very powerful piece of software. And we built a lot of sites on Drupal that we were really proud of for, for big organisations. And um, but we just increasingly found it uh, a technology that was hard to love. And um, at the same time, we're building apps uh, in, in in Django and just you know really really enjoying the the kind of the acceleration that we got from from using from using Django and Python and um and I guess we we didn't we didn't set about to write another content management system because it's you know it's it's a kind of uh, it's something that you you hope somebody else will do for you and um and there are lots of great tools out there but we were commissioned by the Royal College of Art very prestigious Arts edu- um, University in, in London, who themselves had done a big uh, evaluation of content management systems and, and hadn't found quite what they wanted, and and so it was an opportunity for us to to build something that we that we felt was kind of learning from the lessons of of using other systems um, uh, on our favourite framework on Django, and that was in late late twenty thirteen, and um, soon afterwards we we open sourced it in um, February twenty fourteen. 
And was that always the plan to open source it? Was that like part of the agreement, part of the, the, the contract to build that? It was part of the contract. And, um, and we were very happy that that, that that was, you know, a requirement. And we've you know, been big supporters and users of open source over the years. But I guess we hadn't anticipated, you know, because there's, there's different ways of open sourcing things. You, you can just build your project for your client and then take out the secrets and put it on GitHub. But... Um, uh, but we wanted to do a bit more than that. But I guess we, we were slightly taken aback by the response that that Wagtail had, and we hadn't we hadn't anticipated that it would quickly uh, become, you know, a, a popular tool. And as as of last week, I think it hit um, seven thousand stars on GitHub, which I know is a, you know, it's just one metric among many, and it's a, you know a bit of a kind of vanity metric. But it is, it's I think that's I think that means that after Django REST framework, it's the biggest Django project um, on GitHub. Yeah, I think that's possibly probably true. Well, I think I, I saw that. I mean, in terms of people using it, I mean, there's um, Royal College, College of Art. I think Oxford, the British NHS, NASA. I mean, it's. I was I was impressed by how widespread its usage was. Um, yeah, I think I think people always, you know, we 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 put those big names up up the front because they they give reassurance, and that was partic- particularly important in the early days of Wagtail when. For our clients, some of whom were quite risk averse, then uh, they could they could see the benefits from the the UI point of view, and they 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 believed us that it was going to be quicker to build their sites. But they were nervous about something that they hadn't heard of before. And and but now being able to reference Google and NASA and the NHS makes a big difference. And particularly in the UK, the NHS has been, you know, that, that's a really big deal because um, the N- National Health Service is, I think, still the world's fifth largest organisation. And this is not just a, a subsite. This is the main NHS site. This is NHS.UK, and um, they they did the migration from a kind of a massive Microsoft uh, infrastructure in a very public way. So they you know really happy to speak about it. And it's um you know this 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 is a site that's very well known to anyone in the UK, and it's the it's like the first place you go to if you're worried about the kind of strange new marks on your arm or something, and uh, you you know. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, it's so an, an important public sector site. And, um, I, I feel like this is, it's kind of a, it's a big story, not just for, for Wagtail, but also for, for Django and, and Python. Yeah, totally, totally, totally. The sites, cause people always say, oh, Django doesn't scale or that you can't build it. You, you can, like these are, these are some of the world's biggest sites built on Django. And yeah, I mean, NHS, super. Instagram, it's pretty much as big as it gets, um, uh, so I, I, so Carlton, because you're, in addition to being a Django fellow, so involved with uh, Django REST framework, I hope we can talk a little bit about what it's like to run a hugely popular open source project that relies on Django, because you have these dependencies. And I imagine there's a number of similarities in terms of keeping your own projects up to date and then linking it up with Django, which has this aggressive release, release cycle in part, thanks to your work, Carlton. Well, mainly Tim's work, as we discussed in the other episode, but yeah. Yeah, but yeah. I mean, because it all starts with Django, right? I mean, and so with Wagtail, I mean, I think that's maybe something that is confusing for people who haven't used it, is you can start a new project with Wagtail, or you can also, uh, just like Django REST Framework, take an existing Django site, right, and and add Wagtail on top of it. Um, do you have a sense, Tom, of which of those approaches is more common? Is it starting out initially with Wagtail or adding it on to an existing Django project? I think the former is more common, so, so starting out with Wagtail. But we're really keen to stress that it, that Wagtail is just a Django app, and um, and it it sits alongside all your other apps, and it's it should be straightforward to integrate. And you know, a lot of the time, uh, there are the, the, the kind of features in in Wagtail that we feel we can't really honestly take credit for because we're just standing on the shoulders of the things that you know that that, that Django has already provided, and and also you know the fantastic ecosystem that you get with with Django and Python means that if there are things that our clients want to do that, that aren't available out of the box in Wagtail, it's always, uh, you know, a pip and stall away. Right. Yeah. I think, I think you, uh, the release cycle is even more aggressive than Django, right? I mean, I think I saw somewhere you had said every two months, but I think the latest was in December of 2018 for 2.4. Is that correct? That's, that's right. So we, we, we're more like three months at the moment. The, the, the target was two months. And, uh, I think, I think we might revise that because two months maybe feels a bit uh, a bit too tight but this again was in this is i guess in response to what uh, some of the lessons that we learned with drupal and um there was a long period between drupal 7 and drupal 8 about, about three years and uh it was during that pro that 
that upgrade cycle, it wasn't really clear how long it was going to be. Um, you know, there were features that they wanted to 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 build into Drupal eight, and um, uh, you know they weren't going to launch it until they were happy with it. Which is you know that's a fine, that's a, like an understandable approach. But it means that if you're someone who's about to invest in Drupal or or has an existing site, then you're left in a bit of limbo, waiting to know you know sh- should I wait or should I build on you know two year old technology. And then when it comes to to the upgrade. There's you know loads of improvements in Drupal eight, but the difference between seven and eight was so big that for many of our clients, the job of upgrading is comparable to starting again, and we we really don't want to be in that situation. So we have we've strived to have a predictable, frequent upgrade cycle, and you know we aim for two months, and we, we've achieved that sometimes. But I think I think it's going to be more like three months. But the idea is that when you do the upgrade, it shouldn't be more than a twenty or thirty minute piece of work. And you're although the you know you're not getting a, a huge list of amazing new features every time because it's the, the cycle is shorter. You feel like you're just taking advantage in a more immediate way of all the work that the community is doing to, to make the software better. Yeah, because unshipped software is like inventory, right? It's like stuff you've got in the warehouse that you're not. It's not on the site. No, get it out, ship it. Like yeah. <laughs> just in time delivery. I like that. That's, that's, that's a good. I'm going to use that metaphor. Colin. It's I like it. Joel Spolsky's. I've robbed it. But oh, um, right. the uh, I think for Django that works exactly the same way. Like we've got the nine. It's nine months more like for Django, and but it's reliable and it ties not just into the upgrade process that you've talked about making upgrades easy, but it's also about confidence in the supported versions policy. So they know, you know, users know that their their version will be supported for that eighteen months, and then they've got that time to upgrade date and. You know, just everything. This the whole ecosystem is more healthy if there's a regular cycle that's you know relatively frequent. And is there still do you do LTSs for Wagtail? Is that still the case? Yeah, we do. Yeah, and um, again, the, the the duration of those LTSs is, is kind of under discussion at the moment. We've had um, some funding from one big but uh, currently secret source who has extended the the duration of the LTS uh, for their own benefits. So that's that's a, that's a nice thing to do for the community, I think, because. Uh, you know, it, it, having a longer LTS is an easier thing to ask for. It's an easy thing to ask for, but um, you know, it com- comes at, as a, at a cost for the maintainers who need to make sure that uh, it's not just the current release that they need to handle of their only security updates, but you know, a release from six or well, nine months ago. Um, and it's not, you know, it's not a huge consideration, but it's uh, there are it's 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 one of the the kind of the small ongoing costs that, that open source maintainers have to be aware of also affects the users who are on the LTS thing you know there's a kind of LTS mindset that and you you end up getting closer and closer to the end of life date and you still haven't updated whereas if you if you don't rely on the LTS if you can not rely on the obviously it's not always possible if you can be in that position then you've kind of got a different attitude to updating which I think is much more healthy for your product not just right yeah yeah the the the, the dependencies right. But I think I've, I've, I've something I've learned in the last couple of years is that um, well, it's you know we we can be idealistic about and uh, and make it as easy as possible for people to 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 be part of a rapid upgrade cycle. It's just not always possible for the, for the ways that some, especially sort of enterprisey organisations, operate. And for them, it's uh, you know the the idea of um, of having to assign even a small amount of budget to an upgrade every two or three months feels a bit scary and and they want to know that there's a, there's a longer LTS. So I think that's something that we have to be conscious of. Yeah, I no, I do accept that. I just, I kind of think that um, the same, very same companies buy vans and cars and other motor vehicles and they don't object to allocating budget to servicing them. Yeah, Carlton and I try to be aspirational and push companies to, uh, yeah, be, be more active. No, but, it. but this is, no, all, it's a mindset. This is it's also a mindset thing right now. Still yeah. updating. But I mean, even... Um, uh, I mean, Carl Meyer has a Django under the hood talk. Uh, he's Django core. And then at Instagram and mentions even Instagram, which is maybe the Django site just went right from one, three to one, eight and just saw what broke. So, um, right. Yeah. yeah, it happens. Well, so I'm curious with Wagtail cause Carlton and I have talked about how at the end of the day, how small the number of people who really make Django happen is what's the sort of core size of, um, contributors. Like how, how does that compare to Django? So we have a we have what we call the core team, and uh, that's currently nineteen people, um, five of whom are here here at Torchbox. But um, you know, I'm, I'm happy that that five is is no longer the the majority of the core team. Um, that was a kind of a goal of mine early on in the project. I think in terms of the, I, I don't have metrics, although I guess I could look at lines of code in in GitHub. But um, uh, 
in particular, Matt Westcott here at Torchbox, who's the lead developer on Wagtail, is, is, is pretty much full-time on the, on the open source product. Uh, so he's full-time on Wagtail. And uh, so I, I, th- I think um, in terms of lines of code, we're, we're probably still in the majority. But I'm, I'm really pleased that the, the core team is growing. And the core team, importantly, isn't just uh, kind of back-end, serious back-end developers. It's people now with like really great UI expertise and people who can write documentation and people who are good at growing communities. Yeah, um, well, that's, I mean, that's one of the things about Wagtail is just the first look, the UI is is beautiful and the documentation now, fantastic. I mean, I know you, you've mentioned in the past the documentation was something you've spent a lot of time focusing, I guess, on that that first user or that first use perspective, right, rather than sort of the deep docs that's more relevant to people who already know it. Right, and I think there's still still much more we can do. That I'm I'm really interested in that first that first thirty minutes experience because I know that's the way that I I work. That other I uh, explore new technologies. It's like in a lunch break, and I um, <laughs> maybe have half an hour, and I want to be able to pip install or you know get, get it running on my laptop and see something working, and then if 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 that experience goes smoothly and feels good, then I'm excited to you know, recommend it to one of my colleagues or, or look into it more seriously. And, um, you know, that probably is, maybe I'm too impatient, but I think, I think, I think that's not uncommon. And I think, no, uh, I think that's standard. <laughs> yeah. So I just think providing, doing the best job you can in that, in that first 30 minutes is, is really important. Um, and that's it's just, it's not, you know, even in Python, that's not as simple as it could be because, uh, we had a good comment recently, um, because uh, we have this uh, get started in seven lines in, in Wagtail and it starts pip install Wagtail. Um, and then uh, someone raised a GitHub issue saying, I, I couldn't pip install Wagtail because um, he said I didn't have permissions. And, and it's because we assume that uh, you're going to do it in a virtual environment. But, you know, for, for someone, some, there might be someone who's interested in, who's heard about Wagtail and is interested in it and hasn't got as far in, in their kind of Python development as knowing about a virtual environment. So, so then we, we then What's we the virtual environment? Okay, how do we... <laughs> Do we need to explain virtual environments, or can we link somewhere? And and you know, actually, there there isn't even a, a kind of completely standard way of running a virtual environment. No, um, not across, at all. It's across, gotten worse across, across operating systems. So that that bit's a bit tricky. And it'd be really good, I think, in in Python generally to 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 do better at that to to support those those new thirty minute users. I think there's a, there's a pep to, I think there's a new pep to sort of remove get rid of virtual environments in Python. Right, that's the the idea i, I think there's some that. work being d- being done on that but yeah i mean i think i i heard as well that when you first launched um the project your team would had been was using vagrant internally right and also made the assumption that everyone um i guess that today that would be sort of docker right would be the vagrant equivalent right right sure and yeah this is another thing that uh, that we learned is that we yeah we we made i think too many assumptions about the way that other people run run Django projects uh, based on our own experience. So I think we, we assumed PostgreSQL and, um, yeah, and a, a few other things and you know, a way of running virtual environments probably. And um, and so we quite quickly in the first six months started pulling those out as we realized that that just wasn't a match for the way that other people were working. But it's probably not something you can predict a priori, right? You can try and explain it as simply as you can and then you realize, oh, actually there's hidden assumptions here and there's hidden assumptions there, but you're not the whole point is the hidden assumptions. You're not going to be able to spot them in advance. So it's kind of okay. Well, you, as long as you improve on it, Carlton. No, but like yeah, yeah, yeah I agree. Know, I'm agreeing and anding. It's 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 an ideal. Yeah. Well, so what's the what do you think is the profile of a Wagtail user? Because I could see someone who doesn't maybe know Django saying, "Oh, well, this is an easier way to get into Django." Is that the case, or is it more an existing Django dev who wants to you know have a CMS for clients? What would you say is the background? I think that's shifting, and to start off with, it was definitely this uh, that 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 persona of someone who's a Django developer who wants content management for their for their app for their client. Yeah, and uh, you know we want to be a, a good choice for that person, and we want to explain the differences between us and, and some of the alternatives. Um, but I think as uh, as Wagtail's reputation grows a bit, and um, then I th- I hope that it, Wagtail will start being an interesting CMS for people who aren't Django developers. In the same way that a lot of people who use WordPress, you know, I'm sure don't know PHP or might, might not even know what PHP is, but would, are still interested in using WordPress. Yeah. So the interesting question then is the hosted solution, because the the vast majority of WordPress users, they want a hosted right. WordPress, not 
I'll they run want hosted, own. and also they want themes, and that's a, that's a really interesting question for us. One of, one of our, our principles with Wagtail's design is that um, we should be completely unopinionated about the kind of site that you want to build. About the uh, we don't we, we definitely don't want to inject any markup, for example, um, or make it make any assumptions right. about how you how you want to define your models. But the um, the flip side of that is that uh, when you run Wagtail Start, you know you do these seven lines, and you in the kind of tada you uh you left with a like a single home page with no styling and um and it's a it's an underwhelming experience for the first time user so so finding a way to kind of bridge that gap between being unopinionated but also uh, you know helping people start with something where they they kind of understand what they could get is is a challenge for us yeah and still and you still have to kind of define your page models and you know create your own templates and you know there's a lot of work to go from the, 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 I've got it started and I've got the nice admin UI and all of that stuff to a fully featured exactly. site. So, so it's hard to imagine how, what the steps would be to, from going from, from that model to a hosted model where, where um, Wagtail becomes, you know, something that's like a, a better option for someone who, who doesn't yet know about um, creating models. And one, one approach that I've been thinking of is something like, um, uh, you know, so if, if you're building a, a React app, now um, you probably use this uh, create React app, create React app yep. yeah. um, command, and that that you know that will stub out an app for you, and you can continue using it. And then at some point, if you want, you can eject from that from that model. So maybe we could have something similar where you uh, you can you can have a kind of quick start Wagtail app that has a a blog and uh, you know custom user model or something. Some some of the basic things that people want to do, and then you can eject out of it and and write write your own models and migrations. Yeah, I saw one extension to Wagtail. Was, I think it's called Code Red CMS, where it's very much designed for creating landing pages and marketing sites quickly. And it uses Bootstrap 4, and it's got some predefined models. And it's, yeah, it's kind of good. If you want to build that site, it's it, that kind of site. It's it's very quick and good, but it's built on top of Wagtail, and it's sort of made some of those decisions. But underneath, underneath the hood, it's you know you've still got um, a Wagtail project. That's right. Yeah, it's a really interesting project, Code Red. I, I was. Uh slightly unnerved when I first saw it because it seemed to be, you know, it's a new CMS using Wagtail, but actually they, they're quite clear in their intentions. And I think they, they expressed the differences in a, in a nice clear way in the, in the readme for the GitHub. And yeah, it's just like you say that you can, you can build um, a simple marketing site using code red really quickly. And but you can theme some bootstrap templates. And, um, and then if you feel like it's, uh, you, you need to customize or extend it more, you can kind of eject out of that and just treat it as a normal Wagtail site. Yeah, maybe let's let's talk about some of the features in Wagtail because I think you alluded to it. It it has a lot in it, and when you just fire it up for the first time and see the the simple homepage, it's not really clear why you would use it. But there's, I mean, we can go down the list, right? I mean, stream fields, search images. I mean, images in particular, right? Because that came out of the first client. The idea that you can have focal points and automatic thumbnails. I mean, these are really amazing features i kind of wonder what the process is where someone finds out about them because i mean the documentation is great but does someone um i I wonder if if there's like a killer feature in your opinion that brings people over versus maybe once they know wagtail they say oh this is kind of keeps me here i don't i don't know there's a killer feature. i I, I think maybe the killer feature in the early days was that the uh the ui was was kind of looked good and was thoughtful and was really focused around the needs of editors and um and I think you know there's lots of like wonderful open source software out there, but we we had the benefit when we were building Wagtail of uh, some some fantastic Python developers, but also uh, a, a UX team and designers who you know, and, and we took the time to to think really about the, the editor experience and making it kind of responsive and seamless and and thinking about editorial workflow and making it look good. And so I think that was probably the sort of the killer feature to start off with. But the reason. I think that once we once you once you started using Wagtail, I think this uh, stream field feature is probably what 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 stands out. And stream field is um, so if I had to kind of describe it in terms of uh, of other content management systems, you have um, you you have two kind of uh, two two possible models. Um, broadly, very kind of in a simplistic way of describing it, you have the the model, which probably more natural to to people to to Django developers where you define all the fields that you think you're 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 going to need to to hold your data and uh, so you have this really nice structured data and it means that you can filter it and uh, 
uh, you can you're, you're keeping a really nice clear distinction between presentation and 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 data. Uh, on the other hand, you have tools like WordPress, which are really popular because they're easy to use, and uh, you have one big field, and you can you type the body in, and you can use kind of WYSIWYG type editor and copy and paste Word stuff into it, and have tables and inline and images and so on, and it's easy to use, but you're you're kind of munging up the the presentation and the and the data, and that means it's difficult to export that in an API, for example, to a native mobile app. Or, um, and uh, and so there are pros and cons to both approaches. And, and Streamfield was is our uh, um, our, uh, our our design for Streamfield was to uh, to, uh, to try to bridge this gap to um, to maintain structured data, but to give editors flexibility within pages. Um, so you can have blocks that 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 repeat and and are reordered and are optional, and so you can create like more interesting narrative type long form content, and um, but but it's still stored in in a structured way using JSON in the back end. Yeah, so you kind of add a header block and a text block and an image field block, and a, you know and you build your page up. From these components, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. And uh, and I should say this is this. I think this was a pretty uh, fresh feature when when we launched it, but it's not it's not unique anymore. And there are, there are, there are implementations of this in other systems. In fact, I think the the new WordPress has a, has a quite a good implementation of this. But um, I think it's uh, it, it it was really it was well designed, and I, I think my colleague Matt Westcott has to take a lot of credit for that. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense if you've have experienced the frustrations of the other two approaches, whereas, it, it, you know, it may not seem quite as impressive uh, for someone new to Django, but f- certainly for me, I, that makes all the sense in the world not to get locked into that, um, yeah, one big block pattern, because yeah. that causes frustration down the line. But it's not exactly, a, it's, it's it's not a kind of killer sales feature, because it's, you know, it took me <laughs> five minutes to explain that to you, and it's a, it's it feels like quite a sort of subtle point. It ends up being important, I think, but... Uh, uh, is not you know it's not the kind of thing you put at the, the top of the list of your your cool features. Um, perhaps you just need to work on your pitch I, there. Though, I think I do because it's quite cool. <laughs> no, the, I think the, the I think the way to do it is what For you me- did is to just say here are the two dominant approaches and they both have um, drawbacks. Um, but it yeah it is something you need to kind of feel the pain first. You can't just trust the pain. Um, so well, so images too. I was really impressed by all the yeah 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 no all the work on a, images right. Just going to say go on. This is. Or maybe do you want to give the, the pitch on all the built-in image features? Well, just before you do, for me, it was amazing because in Django land, when Wagtail came along, there wasn't, you know, there were some um, third-party apps out there that handled image uploading, but they, none of them were particularly nice. And then Wagtail did it really well. Um, you know, you could upload images and, as you say, select focal points and all these kind of things. That's actually not very glamorous, but it's quite hard to implement properly. And Wagtail kind of did, and it was like, ah, yeah, this is really nice. Oh, that's nice to hear, but... Uh, and I think I, I guess it's um, I was partly driven because our first client, Royal College of Art, uh, as you imagine, the very uh, you know the the visuals are really important to them, and um, and so we needed to we we to make sure that they were displaying the the image content in a really clear way, and also it's something that I've just noticed a, as a, a lot in some pretty big high profile news sites. You know, you often get this situation where you have a on the on the details page, so like a, a news item, you have a nice big hero image and um maybe the photographer has used you know, like the rule of thirds and the 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 portrait is you know over on the on the left or the right hand side but then on the index page showing the latest items they'll do like a square crop and um and sometimes the crops are you know cutting off half the face of the, the person the subject's about and um so that was uh, uh and in wagtail you specify the the, the focal in, the focal point so you, you draw an area around the thing which you want to crop in um, and I think that that's more flexible than allowing editors to, to do actual crops because you don't know quite how that focal crop might be used, that focal point might be used in, in future designs. So it means that um, then, you know, when, when you're resizing the image for different devices, for example, it's just going to make sure that it's always maintained around that, around that point. And I think it's, it feels like a small detail, but it's, it's, it can be the difference between a site that looks uncared for and one that looks like it's really making an effort for its, for its audience. Yeah, I think that's really important, especially since Django is a predominantly back-end framework that, that love and care for the front-end. Uh, yeah, it matters. It matters a lot. Even to the most you know, design-challenged back-end engineer, they can tell when it's thought out. But kind of like the whole point of a CMS is that you take the, 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 the sort of the hand-cropping element of the, the work out of it for people, right? That you don't want them hand-coding HTML. You don't want them hand-cropping images. So to have it done automatically and nicely is 
is the raison d'etre. Right. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. And I, actually, there's been some really interesting work um, in uh, in the kind of third party ecosystem around image handling. And one of my favorites is um, by uh, uh, this uh, someone from a Swedish agency, Martin Sandstrom, who um, he built uh, a plugin called Wagtail Altify, and um, this uses these um, hosted machine learning tools, so computer vision um, services. And uh, the, the one that works best is actually the Microsoft one. And as you upload your images, it will send those images off to the to the image recognition service. And um, within you know a, a few hundred milliseconds, you get a, a suggested title and tags for each image as it's uploaded. And and it's and, and this was in your Django Con Europe talk that you that's gave. right. Yeah, yeah. My talk was about uh, was not about Wagtail. It was about um, how Django developers can uh, can take advantage of these cheap, amazing cloud machine learning services and sort of inject magic into their apps and and this is this is one really really nice example of that i think um and it's not you know that the, you, you always get a laugh when you show this because some of the some of the descriptions are, are obviously inaccurate but actually you know they get better and better and i think um the expectation is not that you just allow the the, the machine to tell you the answer but you use it as a as an aid so it's um it's something that should augment the the editor experience for particularly for for large like really big busy news sites i think um i think you know it's it's the kind of thing that can really chip away at the the sort of the the, the like the basic legwork that editors have to do so what's the process by which something like that makes its way into wagtail i mean like south is a great example of you know migrations coming into django um is there an example of that or do you just really focus on wagtail itself and just let the third party be third party since that's a lot to manage yeah so that that's an example of something that isn't in wagtail itself but but uh because you know it's 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 really cool but we don't imagine that everyone wants to use that um but we we highlight it so there's a there's an awesome wagtail you know the you know these awesome x repositories that uh, i have the awesome django one Oh wow! Wow! Congratulations. <laughs> um, so, well, there uh, was an older one, but it stopped being maintained, so I have the new one. Yours is more awesome. And well, so some, some, someone made a an awesome wagtail, and, and we keep that up to date. And you know that that's that's currently where we we highlight the kind of uh, community plugins. But actually, there's been some discussion about whether we should do a better job of that. And you know, uh, there are, there are a few apps that have their own kind of nicely presented marketplaces not that I, not i'm not really imagining a kind of commercial marketplace but but something that makes it easier f- to to surface these kind of tools yeah because the ecosystem's now got the size to the size where it's discoverability is yeah, difficult yeah. right you can't just follow one account on twitter and have it all appear yeah, anymore. i think that's true no yeah. yeah well i know that's a, ch- a challenge for django itself is uh you know django itself doesn't have an awesome django repo because then they're sort of being opinionated and you know, frankly, as a book author, I wish they had a books page um, where they just listed all the Django books because there are very few. But, um, you know, when someone Googles best Django books, they find my blog post instead. So, I, you know, I understand the tension. Isn't, um, isn't one of the rules, I don't know if it's an, an unwritten rule, one of the rules about the awesome X repositories is that they can't be started by the creators of X? Oh, I'm not sure. Well, so to be frankly honest, so I started the awesome Django repo again with the idea of... Oh, this one's out of date. And then I started down the process with the awesome maintainer of going through all the steps uh, needed to do. And then I just got swamped with stuff. So it's technically not in full compliance, but Mm -hmm. I, you know, my way of maintaining it is I just say, this is basically Will's repo and you're welcome. (laughs) Do you accept submissions to it? Um, I should, people have done them On, on occasion. I'll accept them, but I don't feel bad about just making it pretty arbitrary because the problem is it just bloats over time because yeah, sure. you just add more and more you don't want to take away and i mean i know a lot of the people too so i don't really want to be um so so i don't know it, it's a it's a tough thing for any awesome or any repo is being you know that referee position but the yeah, curation is. is nice i mean you know, for example like there's third-party packages there's the django packages site which lists all of them and you can filter a bit um awesome django has I don't know, 20. And it's, you know, it's not like strictly by stars. It's basically the ones that I think are cool and I'm constantly adding new ones. But, um, you know, I was getting kind of burned out on the awesome Django thing and I was just like, you know, I'm just going to do it <laughs> for myself. Yeah. But yeah, that's, there's no perfect way to do it. So no, but 
No, but it's really difficult to field the requests. Like, it, so you asked earlier on about maintaining a large open yes, source project. Yes, tell us, Carlton. It's exactly <laughs> that. No, but it's exactly that problem. Is there's ever coming in streams? Can you add this? Can you add this? Can you add this? And you have to choose. Otherwise, it becomes unmanageable. And I think that the issue, the Django Docs has a policy. Look, we just don't link to third party things because they disappear and we have to keep them updated and they're not reliable. So we need sites like Awesome Django or Awesome Wagtail to curate the list, but it has to be curated. Otherwise, it's just noise again. Yeah. So Tom, if you could snap your fingers, what would you like to change or what features would you like to see, you know, a perfect developer drop down and implement in Wagtail? Uh, I, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a, a kind of a brand new feature, but I think the, um, the a really important direction for us is supporting the, the headless model better. And um, I think this is a clear direction in, in content management generally. And um, we're seeing more and more of our own clients wanting it and talking about it and, uh, and, and you know, just more generally in, in the industry. And there's some really interesting products and services, things like Contentful, you know, proprietary hosted headless CMS. And um, so this is where the CMS act just, just exposes an API, which then clients use to build sites or whatever exactly, on top yeah. of. I should have explained that. So with it's, like React or Vue or, or uh, Elm, Carlton, right? So. Or even a even a publishing pipeline might consume content from the CMS. I don't know if you're creating physical newsletters or something, but the idea being that it's the CMS kind of stops at the API level. Yeah, that it's not um, it's not responsible it for the presentation part. Um, I was going to say that Wagtail actually supports this pretty well, um, and uh, a really a really uh, an early user. In fact, probably the first user of Wagtail in this way was the Hillary Clinton campaign, who um, who kind of secretly. Uh, commissioned the uh, the first API for Wagtail uh, in order that they could use it in a headless way. And, um, uh, you know, the people who were behind the, the, the Barack Obama campaign, um, you know, kind of a lot of them made their careers out of the success of uh, that. So we were waiting excitedly for the day that we were going to say that we brought yeah, in. Yeah, actually, her. I had a, a, a colleague who worked <laughs> on the Hillary campaign. And All right. um, I remember him mentioning uh, Django and I was like, what? Now yeah. he was sort of hush hush about it. I right. that, that, that ties that circle together. For yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, that story didn't, didn't quite play out. But um, <laughs> yeah, uh, but um, there's always twenty twenty. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. So they they commissioned the first uh, the first API and said that that was a headless site. And um, and then actually uh, Tom Christie, uh, the you know the the author of Django Rest Framework, rewrote the Wagtail API to use DRF, which is you know that was that was a, a good day that uh, that PR landed. Um, uh, without warning, you know, it just just popped up in GitHub. That was pretty exciting, and um, so uh, so Wagtail works well in that way. But uh, we don't do a great job of documenting it, and um, I think we we should have some good demos and blog posts. And there are some features that we can add. So in particular, preview is is a bit of a problem with uh, with headless CMSs generally because you know in in standard Wagtail when you hit preview, we're able to to take the the data that that you've just been writing and push it into the into the template and you immediately see how it's going to look if you're uh, if this if is you're, if you're in, in editor mode so yeah, not on a live site yeah exactly yeah in, in editor mode you're seeing and it's not even a draft it's 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 just the changes you've just made even before you may have saved it as draft um and you really want that cycle to be to be quick and you know to, for editors to be able to kind of play with their content and and immediately get feedback on how it's going to work um and but if if Wagtail isn't responsible for the front end. It's harder for it to to, to represent that. So we we want to find a, a good generic way of being able to preview from from different front ends, and that requires making some changes to the API that mean that we can store that uh, that kind of um, ephemeral preview data in the API in a way that's accessible in the API, which has its own challenges because then the front end may have. Uh, it needs to authenticate in a different way. Um, yeah, the authentication is the one that jumps out. Yeah. Well, it, when you look at um, changes in Django, I mean, specifically, I guess, async, are there any things down the line on the roadmap that will cause, uh, will force major changes within Wagtail itself, you know, 3.0 and all the rest? I think I, I think async is the only one, and async is just something that's really exciting for us and for, for all Django products, I guess, because, uh, because of the... The, the potential for you know rapidly improved performance um and are so, you a big believer in that because i know yeah there's you know so it, it definitely can work in some cases and at massive scale there there is a question of whether it's you know 
more than you need for a, a moderate site, I guess. Right. I'm curious what your personal view uh, on that I'm, is. I'm, I'm a believer in the, in the potential performance gains. Um, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm a bit skeptical about what it's going to take for, for the, for Django and the Django community to adopt it in a way that realizes those gains. There is, there is secret news in that Andrew Godwin opened yes. up, uh, a, a pull request on Django, um, master last week uh, at the, um, the sprints, right? Django Con Europe sprints, uh, introducing like that, that first step into, um, an async handler at the very HTTP layer. Um, and that's not the middleware and that doesn't let you yet write async views, but that's, that's definitely mergeable. Not maybe exactly is, but with a re review or two, that's definitely mergeable. And then that's, we're on the road. Um, and it's coming. I think where the, the async really could help a project with like Wagtail is where you've got to do multiple fetches and a REST API will pick um, one model and then another model and another model. It would be very easy if we had async views to write a kind of proxy view that did a couple of fetches and combine them without necessarily having to jump all the way into, say, GraphQL or something, you know, which is a totally different technology. Exactly. Yeah. yeah um, that's so a good I'm, example. I'm excited about I that. I think yeah. another, another relevant use case in, in Wagtail is... Uh, Cache invalidation, you know, one of the, one of the hard things. And uh, <laughs> uh, we um, we Wagtail plays nicely with a lot of the, the big caching proxies like CloudFront and Cloudflare and um, Varnish and so on. But uh, those those invalidation calls can be quite slow. And uh, we, you know, you you want to check at what point the invalidation has successfully returned. So uh, the simple way is to run Celery and have a worker and keep checking. But if we can just do that in an async way, then that just simplifies a lot of code. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so another feature that um, with Wagtail is, I guess it's an experimental, is the AB testing framework. Can you briefly talk about that? Because that looks really interesting. Yeah. I'm, uh, this is, um, it's, it's again, it's not part of Wagtail itself. It's, uh, although it's under the, the, the Wagtail organization in GitHub, it's, um, it's a tool that was commissioned by a bank in, in Norway. And, um, and that's relevant because uh, uh, there are some great products and services for doing a b testing and one that a lot of people know about is google optimize and um and that works by um it's you know javascript that you embed and then you have this ui that's off-site that uh that lets you define the different variants so the different options that your users might see but it means that when you load the page the javascript is having to rewrite bits of the dom and um and as a, a for for banks and, I, and this is definitely during norway and i probably i imagine in in lots of uh lots of territories it's not allowed to have third-party systems rewrite the content of the of the oh markup. interesting yeah it's probably in the, yeah in the u.s very draconian mm -hmm. with how they yeah right so um and rightly yeah. so 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 that that rules out you know the use of these these kind of sophisticated front-end tools and um so they commissioned us to build a, uh something that was that worked natively in wagtail and um and it's you know it's definitely simpler than those other tools, which you know uh, you know have got teams of people working on them full time. But it it allows you to create different variants of your of your content, usually as as, as different pages, and then uh, to to start running experiments. And then um, it uses a kind of middleware to 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 swap between them, and uh, typically you know setting a cookie to make sure that you that users are directed to the the relevant one each time, and then has some simple reporting. And um, and it's not. As I said, it's not um, it's not the most featureful A/B testing, but I think the important thing about A/B testing is just to start doing it. You know, we, yeah, everyone, just to have it. Everyone knows that it's it's best practice. That uh, you know, especially if you're getting a reasonable amount of traffic, you should just test which option re you know, results in more donations for your for your charity or uh, signups for your letter or whatever it is, or you know, or sales for your product, and uh, and then. You know, the, the tools are there for you, for you to, to run those experiments and, and pick the best one and then move on and do the, do the next test. So I th our focus has been on having something that works simply and is uh, easily integrated. Also from a, a web web performance point of view, like having JavaScript re-render the DOM, that's going to be quite slow, right? Noticeably slow on mobile devices and all that's these right. things. That's right. Whereas having it rendered server size is going to be, you know, the same speed essentially as not doing A-B right. testing from a performance that's point right. of view. That's right. Uh, and there is still, you know, we... Uh, kind of old timers remember the uh, the so called flash of unstyled content that we used to get, and uh, yeah, yeah. as they said before, the CSS kick, kicked in, and uh, and you still get the the flash of un un AB tested content uh, with these tools, which you can minimize in some ways, but it's uh, it's a bit tricky to manage. There are still performance implications though, because if you're doing AB testing uh, server side, that makes it harder to do straightforward 
uh, caching using Cloudflare or CloudFront and one of those tools. So. Okay. Yeah. 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 Fair enough. Well, uh, you know, as we sort of wrap this up, Tom, one question I had for you is since so much of your work is with nonprofits and you seem very mission focused, you know, as I saw in a talk, you mentioned the moral dilemma of, you know, open source software where Wagtail is used by lots and lots of people doing lots and lots of things. Yeah. I wonder if you could just speak to that because I don't, you know, I, Django is used by lots of lots of sites, porn sites, all the rest, um, what your thoughts are on Wagtail doing that? Because most licenses, you can't, there isn't really an open source license where you can restrict the usage, I don't believe. No, I, I don't know of one. It is it is an interesting uh, dilemma. I don't know if it's a dilemma because there's not much we can do about it, but it's uh, <laughs> there, there are definitely people using Wagtail who who we wouldn't work for. Um, yeah. And, uh, uh, and, and also the question comes up about, you know, and, and some of those may, some of those people may be asking questions on the, on the, Wagtail Slack or, or you know Stack Overflow and so on, and we we're committed to helping everybody in those communities. So so yeah. you know th- we definitely will be by one way or another supporting people whose whose goals you know we we may not agree with, but I, it's pretty hard to, I think to to try to you know forensically hunt yeah. down what, on the the who's on the right side of the line, and I guess we generally feel like open source is a is a force is a positive force in the world and. Uh, and people using open source are, are you know, in in a small way, helping with that. And so, you know, there's there's a, there's a kind of justification for, I guess, for supporting open source generally. Yeah. No, I just I, what was interesting to me is just that you asked the question because it's not something often asked, um, and certainly <laughs> it should be in technology. So yeah. I just thought, and I guess that comes from you know many of your clients and running an agency and choosing who you work with. That makes right. a lot of sense. Right. Yeah. I'm sorry, I don't have a more coherent answer. So was there anything, Tom or Carlton, we wanted to include as we as we wrap up? Well, what's the what's the future of Wagtail, right? Like you you sort of alluded to it, but yeah, what's yeah, good. you know, if you look ahead, um you mentioned headless, um potentially themes and deployments. Are there where would you like to see it in a couple of years if if all plays out? I think the two main directions are the are the ones I've mentioned. So one is Making Wagtail feel like a, an attractive option for 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 anyone, not just a Django developer, and I think a lot of that is about about improving that that experience for the first thirty minutes, which could be having a hosted service or just really really working on that on those those beginner steps. And the second is the the headless thing, and I think you know a, a kind of not quite clear goal for us could be to be the the top choice for a open source headless CMS. So, yeah, you know that would be. The, Whatever, whatever the technology. If you if you uh, if you if you want to go headless, then you know you've got great commercial tools like like uh, Contentful. But if you want to go open source, then Wagtail is your top choice. That that would be a, a good something for us to strive for. I think. Yeah, well, I, I know Carlton and I have talked a, a bunch about deployment in Django because that's you know as the as the author of books, I sort of I, I get so many questions about the deployment sections, which I use Heroku, which is you know as easy as it gets, but is still yeah. quite a leap and. Um, so I often also think about how do I, you know, can you just push a button and solve this for people? Because it is, it's it's really tricky, even with platforms as a service. Yeah, yeah. It would be, I mean, even with um, companies like Divio, who get, you know, they kind of help with that that deployment story. You st- you know, you still got your Django project, which isn't quite as easy to get off the ground as a WordPress, you know, for instance. And so it, it would be really nice if there were, you know, maybe on top of Wagtail or on top some some other way but if there were this kind of you can get a blog up and running pretty yeah quick. i think that eject model um, that react has i mean is really nice because you know ejecting is it's pretty pretty forceful once you eject you're out but you can go a long way and um right like you, you, you can go quite quite a long long runway and i think they do a pretty good job of saying yeah once you eject you're on your own yeah yeah i've been trying to imagine um you know, from from a user point of view, what the best possible way of uh, what the best user experience would be for deploying a site? And you're right. You know, this is the question that that most people ask, and you see this on Reddit and Stack Overflow. It's, you know, I've I've been through the tutorial, I've built my site, now I'm stuck because I can't get Nginx to talk to Unicorn. Uh, yeah. And, uh, well, it, yeah. It's, and it's tricky that stuff, and it's you know, and there's lots yeah. of different edge cases and different different ways that it can fail. So my what, as people make an entire living thinking, doing just that. It'd be nice to have a new manage.py command, manage.py deploy, and it says, "Do you want to deploy?" Yes, to, yes, you know, to uh, Heroku or Divio or uh, Nginx or you know, um, 
yeah, yeah. yeah we yeah we should have that <laughs> carlton i know you agree oh look a, a look a flying pony <laughs> yeah but, right well yeah no i i think yeah i i do agree i think that's um still the part of the story which is most difficult but and i think you just have to be really opinionated with it is is the thing is that you, you almost need to not ask a Django developer, but, you know, get a group of these beginners and, you know, optimize for that. And, you know, we can talk about the trade-offs all day long, but um, yeah, they can object th when they need to. But, you know, we're, we, we sort of have the wrong perspective on it, I would say. I think you're right. Yeah. Talk to the beginners. Yeah. I mean, you know, the problem then is that this is the problem with Heroku and all these platforms as a service is that it's a, it's a business model challenge because so then you get all the beginners and intermediate people and then um, once they become sites that would actually pay the bills, they're tempted to uh, to leave. But I think even that is changing. I mean, um, it just makes so much sense for most sites to have a managed hosting solution. I, but um, great. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Tom. We're going to have links to all the things we've mentioned. Um, is there anything, Carlton, you want to add? No, super. I mean, you know, normally I'd say more, but Tom's really hit all the points right in the head so I can just sit and listen. That's great. And is there a way for people to contact uh, or contribute to Wagtail or get involved with it, Tom? Absolutely, yeah. So it's uh, github slash wagtail slash wagtail. And uh, there's a there's a Slack channel at um, wagtail.io forward slash Slack. Those are the probably the, the easiest entry points. Um, or email me, tom at torchbox.com. I'm really, I'm really happy to help anyone get started. Wow, that's that's a gutsy move giving your email out like that. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> well, and and for this podcast, uh, you can always see new episodes at djangochat dot com. Um, please leave a review, and we'll see you all next week. Bye. Bye bye. All right. Thanks. Bye bye. Thanks for joining us, Tom.